The world's oldest purse is 5,000 years old. I don't know where they have it. It's not in my house. It's not at your house. I've never seen it in a museum. But they say it's 5,000 years old, and maybe the reason that we've not seen it is because, according to Wikipedia, it belonged to a man. Men carried purses initially, but in modern Europe, and you know in Europe they're the ones that set all the trends for fashion, the fashion trend began to go in opposite direction. Instead of men carrying the purses, it got to where the purses were designed for women to carry them. They become more ornamental, and men's fashion decided that it just didn't fit right for them. In recent years, women's fashion designers have created handbags. They're not called purses any longer. They're handbags. And many of them are so expensive that if you go into the stores where they sell them, they're under lock and key. No longer seen as an essential, a lot of handbags today are more used as status symbols. I remember well the vitality of handbags to the first women in my life, my mother, grandmothers, my aunts. There were occasions when a particular bag was essential as an accessory to a certain outfit or an event, the size, the, the color, the shape of the bag made a difference, whether it was a clutch or whether it had a strap. The size of the bag was especially important to my mother when we went to the movie theater. We scraped up the best we could to get a ticket. We sure weren't going to buy the popcorn nor the drinks. The size of the bag was needed for all the stuff that went in with us. I've discovered over time that the name of the bag is distinctive. There's bags, then there are those handbags, and some ladies carry hobo bags, some carry a purse. A lady texted me last night, she thought she had lost her clutch. I knew what it was because I had researched for this sermon. <laughs> some ladies carry what they call an evening bag, some a pouch, some a shoulder bag, some a satchel. The one I really like but you'll never see me with is the man purse. There are a lot of men that carry those these days. They cover it up by saying it's essential. I carry my laptop, whatever they need in it. It's a man purse. My mother carried a pocketbook. That's what she called it, pocketbook. You go in most stores today that sell them, they don't have a sign up that says pocketbooks for sale. But that's what she called it. She had her share of them. We have two or three of them at our house. She left them to us, different shapes, different sizes, different colors. Always to be fashion conscious, particularly on Sundays, my mother wanted to make sure her pocketbook matched her outfit. Certain pocketbooks made it to church on Sundays. Not only should they match her outfit, but that pocketbook had to carry all the essentials that my brother and I needed to keep us calm, cool, and from being disruptive during preaching. What my mother had in that pocketbook was vital to us. Whether it was Kleenex for blowing noses, ink pens and crayons for artwork on the bulletin, lifesavers, passing them down to pew to curb our appetite, cough drops when we got a little tickle, a quarter to put in the offering plate whenever it was passed by, a brush to calm down our cow licks, mother's pocketbook. It was as much an essential to us as it was to her. And right now, 50 years later, right now, I could smell that. I could smell that fragrance whenever she would crack that pocketbook open. Her perfume would come out of that pocketbook. And it seemed to be on everything that she passed down to us, whether it was the napkin or whether it was the Kleenex, whether it was that special tissue or whether it was the Lifesavers. We couldn't taste it but we can smell it, and I can smell it right now. Mother's pocketbook, not just a kit for meeting our needs for an hour in church, it was also an extension of the many ways that she loved us and took care of us, my brother and I. I suspect I'm not the only person in the room this morning that remembers with fondness the many ways our mothers pacified us with that pocketbook. Times have not changed that much. There have been times in the sanctuary in recent years when I've seen little ones squirming or maybe wake up from a nap and call out in as best a whisper as they could, 
I need my lovey. And mom would open that pocketbook, and in that pocketbook would be his or her lovey, and she would snuggle up to it, that soft little silky piece. Maybe it was something off of mom's old gown, but it gave that baby comfort, and that little guy or little girl went right back to sleep. The victories of motherhood. They're often huge, but they occurred largely behind the scenes, and the results are typically not apparent until years down the road. Like ivy on a garden trellis. We see that our lives are inescapably entwined with the great guidance of our parents, and especially that one that gave us birth that we call mother. She didn't just birth us, she cuddled us. She cuddled us and she cradled us and she rocked us when we needed it. She corrected us, sometimes with a word and sometimes with a swat when we needed that too. She tucked us in bed at night and she made sure that there were no monsters that were under our bed. She stayed up late with us when we were sick and she stayed up late waiting for us when we were not at home when we needed to be. She prepared our favorite meals and she taught us how to prepare them because she knew that one day she would not be there. She made some of our clothes <clears throat> and she helped us with our hair. She prayed for us and she sacrificed for us in ways that we did not know. She was the proudest one there. When we got our award. And she made sure she didn't get too close and hug us when she knew that it would embarrass us in front of our friends. And there's not anybody here today that wouldn't want to feel that hug right now. Motherhood. It was God's idea. It was a good one. God created humanity in God's image. And God made them male and God made them female. And then for whatever reason, God decided that God would make more of them. But God would allow them to have a part. And so God planted in that female a little seed that became a baby. The female was no longer known as woman. She became mother. The interesting thing was that God planted that baby there and God allowed that baby to come forth, but God didn't send an instruction sheet with that baby. Nor does God do that today. God knew that there was something within that mother that flowed out of her that would nurture that baby and nourish that offspring. It's that love that the Apostle Paul details, I believe, when he says that love is patient and it is kind and it is generous and it is truthful protective and trustworthy and hopeful and above all things, enduring. Overheard a young woman comment last week about how much better her son's penmanship is than hers. She left awfully young to have a child that could write. And so, you know, I'm never one of those that just kind of sits in the corner when the music starts playing. I like to dance. So I engaged her in conversation. I said to her, you don't look old enough to have a child that can write. How old is your son? She said, seven. Seven? I am so surprised. You don't look old enough to have a seven-year-old. She said, I'm not. But I had a big part in making him, and God gives me what I need to love him and to raise him, and I would not give him up for anything. It caused me to begin to think about the traits and the skills and the gifts within mothers. Skills and gifts and traits that I've observed in mothers those things that God has given to them. She thinks outside the box, but does not lose track of the box because she knows her child will need the box for the school project that she and he will complete. She has strong skills in negotiating, conflict resolution, and crisis management, especially while driving, cooking, and working on the project due tomorrow that she found out about yesterday. She reconciles disbursements like an ATM and has the capacity to measure each one such that all her children receive equally. She manages stimulating technical challenges like 
stuck zippers and broken hair clasps and frozen computers and retrieving things that were dropped down the toilet. She withstands criticism such as, you are a mean mommy. You just don't understand. And then the one that comes when your children are teenagers, I hate you. At least until that child needs a few dollars to go skating or to the mall or to hang out with friends. She possesses the physical stamina to carry the load of a pack mule and be able to go from zero to 60 in three seconds in case this time the screams from the backyard are not just someone crying wolf. She has an energetic entrepreneurial spirit because she does fundraising, party planning, and production coordinating for her children during her free time. She has a diverse knowledge of all the subjects to answer the questions that are posed to her. Questions like, Mommy, how did that baby get in her tummy? What makes the wind move? Who is God's mommy? Why did everybody get invited to the party except for me? She is always on duty, does her best to look her best at all times, and must not ever embarrass her children, no matter the situation. She always hopes for the best, but is prepared for the worst and the fallout that may come with it. She has the diplomacy to counsel and convince her children to do the right thing and make them believe it was their idea all along. Mothers, certainly not just God's idea, but a gift from God, who is our heavenly parent. None of us in this room <clears throat> are small enough small enough to not have had our falls. And typically our falls result in a scraped elbow or a skinned knee or a fractured ego or a broken heart. When we were little, we ran to our mother when we had something like that happen. We would run to her desiring for her to pick us up and cuddle us and soothe our hurt and wipe away our tears. We've all heard. We've heard that mother's myth you know, when the mother bends over and says, come here, honey, let me kiss it and make it all well. As if a mother has magic lips or a healing saliva. She picks up that hurting child and she kisses that little skinned boo-boo and she craves that child in her lap and things begin to get a whole lot better. You've been there. I've been there. Mom's been there. Does mom's kiss... Does mom's words, does mom's saliva make everything better? Certainly not. So what is it that makes it all better? It's that time in mama's lap. It's that time when mother picks us up and cradles us and holds us, brushes back our hair, kisses on us, tells us it's all going to be all right. It's that ten minutes in mama's nap. And maybe more than anything else, it's because Mama holds us and hugs us, and Mama even says to us as tears begin to fall from the corner of her eye, and we look at her and go, Mommy, why are you crying? It's my knee that hurts. And she says, because you hurt, I hurt. Because you're sad, I am sad. That does more for us than all the Neosporin and the colored band-aids in the world. Just sitting in Mama's lap makes it all right. So what does that mean for us as big kids? Well, the scripture we read said that we're children. Children of God. Not just called children of God, but that we are children of God. And for us it is to embrace the promise of God that assures us that we are invited to climb up in God's lap and let God cradle us and love us and wipe away our tear and kiss us. And as we hear those words from that mother that says, I love you, it's going to be all right, we hear those words of Jesus that says, Come to me, all you children. You little children and you big children. 
you young children and you old children, you white children and you black children, you rich children and you poor children, you boy children and you girl children, you tired children and you broken children. Because you're all my children. You come to me, all you children. And in the words of the prophet Isaiah, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. There's a story that's hidden there in the Old Testament. We don't get back there too often. We like to read the words of Jesus. But back there in the Old Testament, in the book of Kings, there's a story. A story that tells of the depths of a mother's love and gives us a glimpse of the love that God has for us. It's a story of two women. Two women, they birth babies. And sometime during the night, those tiny little babies are there with, there with the women and one baby dies. And so the two women recognize there are two of us but there's only one baby and they begin to have a little squabble over who the baby belongs to and so they decide they'll take that baby to the king and let the great king settle their dispute and so they do. And they show up before King Solomon there and the great and wise king looks at the two ladies and he looks at the one baby and he says, oh, I know certainly what to do here. We can solve this. So he calls in the ombudsman and says, bring in the sword. We'll cut the baby in half and make sure that the two parts are shared between these two ladies. And the two ladies stand there and as the gentleman takes his sword and is about to touch it upon the baby's skin, one of the ladies pipes up because in the crescendo of compassion she can't stand back any longer and she says, Wait a minute, wait a minute, it's not, it's not my baby. Let her have it. Let her have the baby. And at that point, the wise king recognizes that certainly it is hers. And so he requests that the baby be placed into that woman's arms. And it's interesting that when that happens, finally the writer designates that woman with the name of mother. Up to that point, they're just women. It's interesting to note that in the Hebrew language, the Hebrew word that crosses over into the English for compassion has as its root the word for womb. And the mother's attitude toward the function of the womb is the basis for the definition of a godly mother. She sees her womb as an agent of freedom, nourish and nourishment and love. It is a safe harbor in which life is nurtured, but it is also an instrument that yields its treasure in order that wholeness and well-being may occur. It is in God. In God that each of us live and move and have our being and as if a mother's womb provides for us all that we need. God sets us free as do mothers. God grants us self-determination as do mothers and God suffers right along with us when we make our poor choices, as do mothers. And God trembles. God trembles with hope that we will become all we were born to be, as do mothers. It is this glimpse of God that causes us a startling sacred expansion of those mothers that we honor on this special day. May all of you mothers Live and love such that we who observe you will get a gentle vision of God and the persons we may one day become if we can become like you. Amen.